Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that often starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. So today I wanted to just break down some of my blood work. Lately, I've been hearing people say, why don't all the long-term carnivores, and I don't even know if I consider myself long-term carnivore, but why don't a lot of the long-term carnivores share their blood work? So I'm kind of a private person as much as I'm online, but I try to make my content more about my clientele, data, and research, and less about my N equals one. Now, I know my story is really powerful and how carnivore has healed me and probably why I'm so passionate about sharing this diet. So in the last couple of years, I have shared my blood work. I just share it with my newsletter because it's the people that are willing and wanting to sign up for my content and will probably not send me a lot of hate mail. But I just think that since other people are sharing, I will share my blood work with the community because I just think there's lately been a little bit of fear mongering, or maybe it's always been going on and I just have heard it now, but let's get right into my blood work. Okay, so as you can see, this blood work is from April of 2022. I was five years carnivore-ish. Um, I eat mostly meat, but then on some days, as I said on many different episodes, that three years in, I started adding occasional vegetables. I'm not super strict carnivore. On most days, I am. Maybe I'll have a pickle or I'll have a little bit of my kids' veggies, or maybe I'll even have a low-carb chocolate. But generally speaking, I highly doubt there are many, many days that my carb count is more than 10 grams. Still, even if it's not that I'm fully carnivore and that's why my markers look better, I don't know if people are going to say that, but I will say that I'm always in a mostly ketogenic state. This is the blood work I shared in my newsletter, I guess over a year ago, and then we will look at our, or my 2023 blood work. Okay. So this is the complete blood count. And essentially this is looking at your overall health. This is very common on general blood work. It helps you to also see if you are possibly anemic, if you're suffering from an infection or leukemia. So most of my markers are within range. Now this is conventional care ranges. So there are some markers where they would say it might be a little out of functional range, but I'm not going to get into that nuance on a YouTube video or a podcast. So I'll just go through some of this, your white blood counts here, your RBC hemoglobin hematocrit. So I don't really see much issues there. I wasn't sure what the RDW meant, but as I did a lot of research, it looks like being low is actually ideal. This is what I wrote in the email. This is the RDW marker mentioned earlier. I'm barely under lab course reference range. Ideal, maybe up to 13. You also don't want to be too low. So the RDW stands for red cell distribution width. And what you really want is that, I guess the lower the number is, the more that your red cells are the same sizes. And ideally you want the red blood cells to be all the same sizes. And so the greater the number, the difference in your widths of your red blood cells. A few functional medicine practitioners have told me that having a lower RDW, but not severely low is a good sign of basically optimal health. And then here's my platelets. Here's some of my immune system. As we go to this next page, here's my glucose. I know for some people, they say that carnivores with a 92, it's pretty high. Well, my 2023 is even higher, but here's my bun. This is the markers for your kidney function. EGFR looks good. I think I show the EGFR and the ranges in the next page. So we'll kind of go through that. Here's some of the minerals. Now, some of the minerals you have to remember is in your blood and your blood are, will always try to find a homeostatic point. There's also intracellular. So within the cells that your blood is not getting measured. That's where sometimes the hair mineral test, or there's even other cellular tests that you can take that will use your blood though, but that you can get more of a better measure of your minerals. So electrolytes aren't the best to just test with blood work. Albumin was a little high here. And when I looked into it, it was just it could be possibly dehydration. It kind of makes sense. And you also want to compare it to hemoglobin and hematocrit. And for me, both of those were within range. So I just probably want to make sure and drink enough water. And then we can always compare it to the results of this year. And I think it's within range this year. These next areas, this is the comprehensive metabolic panel. This specific area is testing the overall liver function and inflammation. I don't think these ranges for lab core ideal. Um, anytime your ALT or your AST is imbalanced or high, it's a sign that your liver 
is inflamed. So there are en enzymes that are being released that show inflammation. Ideally, you want to be mid to low twenties and below. So you can see right here, ALT, AST look pretty good. When you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as fatty liver disease, you drink a lot of alcohol, you have a lot of fructose, you will see this marker go up a lot. Now, some people also have imbalances there because they're taking a lot of medication. Maybe their li liver function is just not ideal, but you never want these markers to be too high. And when I interviewed with Dr. Richard Johnson, he said that when they're already in their forties, um, the marker is in the range of the forties, the ones right here, that's already a sign that your liver is having inflammation. Now these markers can go down pretty quickly. I've seen that a lot with our clientele. This is my cholesterol. I think it looks pretty common for a carnivore. And so my LDL is high, my HDL is 60s, and then my triglycerides are in the 73s. I don't like to see triglycerides above 99. I think that's where we think of the floating fat and it's just, there's extra fat. So whether you're eating carbs and they're getting converted to fat in your bloodstream, that can also become triglycerides that way or you're maybe consuming too much rendered fat in a carnivore diet and your body is not able to process it as quickly. Just the quick notes that I put in my newsletter, I prefer triglycerides under 85, but I also don't want to see it too low. So sometimes I see long-term carnivores or one plus two plus year carnivores and their triglycerides are in the forties. And to me, it's a sign that they're likely under eating or they're not eating sufficient fat. I also don't like to see HDL above 85 or 90. So minus 60, maybe it could get improved to seventies. I can eat more saturated fat. I can eat more fatty fish, but when you see it go too high, there are signs of inflammation, toxicity, oxidative stress, or even autoimmune balances when the HDL gets too high. Again, there's context. It's not that you just want your HDL to be super high. That's not always a true statement. And then LDL, I know that this is pretty normal for a carnivore or somebody that's on a ketogenic diet. I don't know if having LDL in the 600s is necessarily ideal. I know that you can fit this lean mass hyper responder. And if your HDL is maybe 60, your LDL is in the 200s and your triglycerides are lower, maybe you do fit the LMHR and that's okay. But I think you should also look at all the other risks to then really discern, is this marker with my CRP, with other markers, is it safe enough that I feel safe that my LDL is this range? So I don't think you should just go by one marker and then say my risk for heart disease is greater or not. And then here, my A1C, I put it right here next to the glucose. I didn't actually test my insulin then. I think it's because I figured the C peptide is a better marker. And then the A1C is more about an average of three months. Now, as I said, right here, there is nuance. So if you ate really clean the last five weeks, then your A1C will probably look better than it actually did in the last three months. Um, there's also false positives where maybe for carnivores, because this is actually measuring our hemoglobin. Well, these are red blood cells. So if you are healthier, there's a tendency for these red blood cells to live longer. So the estimate is that the average red blood cell will live about three months. And so we can gather how much sugar has accumulated over those three months. Well, if your red blood cells are healthier and they're living longer, then more will accumulate over time. In a carnivore world of things, as Dr. Ben Bickman, Dr. Paul Mason has said on my channel, maybe your A1C is going up a little bit because your red cells are living longer and that may be okay. What matters more is how much your insulin is going up and down. So if your blood sugar is going really high and then insulin has to come and save the day. And then if that's not working, if cortisol has to come, then maybe this number is not good. But if it's just that my blood sugar is barely really moving, maybe it's moving 20 points up and down in terms of milligrams over deciliters. If that's all it's moving throughout the day, then it shows blood sugar stability. So it really depends on the context. What I can tell you for my own N equals one is I never wake up in the middle of the night. So that's a good sign that I'm probably not having hypoglycemic effects in the middle of the night. Cortisol is not having to come in rush and save my blood sugar levels and release more sugar. So I sleep through the night. My hormones in general are balanced. My menstruation for the, all of the world to know is balanced and I, it's consistent and I was able to nurse my son five years and I was carnivore the whole time. So, or the, or at least the last four years of his five-year life. So in my context, I think my A1C being 5.2 and my glucose being 92, like I'm not too worried about that. And for the C peptide, 
Um, this marker also releases when insulin releases. So insulin can be affected by so many different things throughout the day. So it becomes really hard to track insulin. I think if you were to measure it throughout the day, you can get a really good read that way, but that's kind of hard to do. Where C-peptide, it's a lot more consistent of a marker. I think Dr. Barry recommends under two is ideal, um, not too worried about 1.8. So based on all of these markers, um, I and then looking at my triglycerides, I would think that, yeah, I'm probably metabolically okay. This goes back to the EGFR, and I just kind of explain, um, this is from the National Kidney Foundation. This is what they consider ideal. So I am, I was 40 at this time, and so anything at 99 is pretty good. And my marker here is 103. I'll just leave this up for a little bit so you can read it. Sometimes I see carnivores with their EGFRs on the lower side. It could be that they're not drinking enough water. So then it's just putting a tax on their kidneys. Maybe there is a little bit of kidney imbalance. Yes, sometimes when you eat proteins, it can cause creatinine, but the BUN and the EGFR to become a little imbalance. But again, it's that context that matters. Every single doctor and researcher I've interviewed that comes to kidney function and eating too much protein. It's just not really a thing. They talk about how some of the studies that said, if you eat too much protein, it's damaging on the kidneys is very old science and that no real science today shows that if maybe you have chronic kidney disease stage four, then maybe you have to be mindful about the levels of protein you eat until you heal. But otherwise for everyone else, it should probably not be an issue to eat the amounts, maybe two to three pounds a day of meat. It should not be an issue for you. Okay. So this is, um, a lot of the thyroid markers. So I know this is like the big one that everyone's like, Oh, if you eat carnivore long-term that your thyroid will get messed up. Here's a little bit of my information. So my TSH is 1.4. There's T4, T3. I know these are not the big ones that people look at. And then there's free T3 down here, which is 2.2, which is pretty good, right? My free T3 was 1.8 several years ago. And that's where the repeat pro metabolic dieter said, you're not feeling well, you need to get on thyroid medications. But I was also nursing my son then. So I don't know, maybe I was under eating a little bit during that time. I just don't know. But now that I'm not nursing and my diet's pretty much the same. Now, I honestly think that if your T3 is even under two, it's not that big of a deal. And I know everyone outside of the carnivore world would be shocked by that statement. I will show you a study by Finney and Volek, but they showed that when you are in a ketogenic state, your basically your thyroid function is a lot more sensitive. So you may not need as much T3 being released for you to feel healthy. So always go by symptoms too. So if you're not feeling well, and then you test your thyroid markers, and they don't look good, then yeah, it's something you may want to consider maybe you're not eating sufficiently, maybe you're not eating enough fat, maybe you're not eating enough variety on a carnivore diet. So if you see this study here, I will share it in the show notes, but it's does your thyroid need dietary carbohydrates. So in this study, they basically talk about how on a low carb diet, your T3 can actually become more sensitive so that you may just need less T3 and you will still function well. So here's a sample. What if the lower T3 levels associated with the well-formulated ketogenic diet are indicative of optimum T3 sensitivity and thus the true physiologic norm for humans? So I will give you this study, but it actually may just be a new norm, almost kind of like how carnivores, we expect a new norm for triglycerides. The standard cares triglyceride markers is 150 and below is normal, but on a low carb diet, we kind of want it to be a hundred and below. If you look at this study, they talk about how for a lot of these people that some people might misunderstand as you are hypothyroid, actually, you're probably not. And you're just following a really good diet, but again, go by your symptoms. If you do feel low energy, it's not always the thyroid. I think there are always other reasons why people may have low energy. I know people always think it's the thyroid, it's the thyroid, but the thyroid is part of the endocrine system, which is all of your hormones, including cortisol. So you may want to look at lifestyle factors of what else is causing you stress in your life. It could also be environment, how busy you are and um, having kids and having a busy, crazy job. So these are all things to think about. I'll just go through this really quickly. So here's all the different thyroid markers. Free T4 is at 1.38, reverse T3 is within range. Um, I test my thyroid antibodies just because so many of my clients end up having Hashimoto's and they never knew. So I don't show anything. Magnesium is within range. And then my CRP is low or is under one, which again goes with general inflammation. And then this is my vitamin D. Now I know a lot of you are going to say 32.7 is low. It gets lowered this year, but I'm totally fine with this marker. There is research where vitamin D it's very nuanced, but maybe the markers that we are chasing isn't naturally 
the markers that we are supposed to be reaching. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't want to get super controversial on this episode. And then LDH is down here and it's 164. Okay. So this is my blood work in 2022. So let's do a comparison. Not much of my diet has changed in 2023. When I did the blood work, we got really busy. Our practice was growing a lot. So I was sleeping a little bit off and I don't know if that has any indicative nature with my blood work. It looks pretty much the same to be wholly honest. I, it's just something that I need to keep aware of that if, as I get busy, as we grow nutrition with Judy, we need to find that balance that I still take care of myself. Okay. So here's a comparison. So this is the blood work I just went over and I went into nuance about all the different markers and this one, I'm just going to kind of go through it quickly. So since now it's the same exact stuff. Okay. So this was taken April of 2023. So it's pretty much a year, uh, separated. So it looks like the CDC looks pretty much the same. It's crazy that the RDW is the exact same number. Um, I don't see a big difference. You could take a quick look at it. My white blood cell count looks like it went up by a smidge. My RBC has gone down by a smidge, but generally speaking, it looks like everything is so similar. Hemoglobin is right around the same range as before. Last year it was 14.4. This year it's 14.7. Hematocrit last year it was 44.4. This year it's 44.3 and so on and so forth. I'm not going to read all the nuances because they're all relatively the same. Now my glucose has gone up and I just don't know, was it an off day? Did I eat a lot of protein right before bed? So protein takes a little bit longer to get through your blood system and just process. I honestly don't remember what I ate before this, as well as what I ate before the blood work in 2022. My BUN is relatively the same. Creatinine looks pretty similar. EGFR has gone down, but still let's look at the range. So last year it was 103 and this year it's 96 and I'm still within range of my age. So around 99 is good. My BUN is 15 and last year it was 19. The one thing I did do differently this year was I just finished 75 hard when I did this blood work. And during the 75 hard challenge, you have to drink a gallon of water a day. Now I don't recommend drinking a gallon a day, especially at my height and weight. I probably should drink half of that, but as part of the challenge, and I just wanted to do the challenge properly, but I have to drink one gallon. And I wonder if that hydrated me because I would also take electrolytes with it because I knew I was over consuming water. And I think my albumin is actually within range this time. Yeah. So last year it was 5.1, which could be a sign of dehydration. And then this year it's 4.6. My AST and ALT has gone up by a smidge. So in 2022, it was 18 for AST. This year it's 21. It's such a small differential. I'm not even worried about it. And then last year, my ALT was 16. And then this year it's 21. Again, I'm not too worried about it. So that's liver function. It looks pretty much okay, but let's go to the thyroid markers again. Okay. So my TSH has gone up. I know for some people above two is not ideal. So I blame this on my sleep. I was getting six ish hours, but I wasn't sleeping consistent time. So I just wonder if that had to do with the big jump from 1.4 last year and 2.2. So mind you, it's not like I went from carnivore one year to two years. This is carnivore five years to six years. So I honestly think there's no other real big difference. My T4, my thyroxine, it was 6.6. .6, now it's 6.5. My T3 uptake was 30. Now it's 30. Free thyroxine was 2.0, still 2.0. And then my free T3 last year was 2.2. And this year it's 2.4. Again, my thyroid antibodies are none. So no signs of Hashimoto's or Graves. Now I had several clients say that they are super sensitive to milk. So I just wanted to do a test on myself. I ordered these lab works on my own, but right here you could see, I just did a test on IgE. So this test IgE milk, uh, lactoglobulin, casein, cheese, cheddar mold, and it shows that I'm not sensitive. And I probably eat dairy every single day. I thought because I'm Asian that I would have some type of lactose sensitivity, but it doesn't look like I do. Now, IgE tests aren't super accurate and obviously go by how you feel. And I have seen clients where this is actually imbalanced. My A1C in 2022 was 5.2. This year it's 5.3. So it's pretty consistent. Here's my free T4 at 1.46. And last year it was at 1.38. My reverse T3, 16.3. Last year it was 14.4. And then my vitamin D is a little bit lower. I'm sure someone's going to say it's because I'm unhealthy, but so be it. 
I am very comfortable with my vitamin D being at this level. I do not supplement and I feel fine. My C reactive protein is less than one. I think one time I did my C reactive protein and it was 0.46. One thing I forgot to share for my 2022 results is my testosterone. So testosterone is 33.2 and then free testosterone is two. I think that is very much in range for a female. And then my DHEA was low or lower at 118. Some of the optimal range functional practitioners say that you should be at 350 and I'm at 200. I'm kind of comfortable with that. I am 41. So I don't necessarily want to supplement. My thyroid markers are normal. They are within range and I am eating a ketogenic carnivore diet ketogenic for seven years and carnivore for six plus. I am regular every month and I'm 41. I don't have any signs of perimenopause and I sleep through the night. My blood sugar is pretty consistent. I'm not going to say that I'm a energizer bunny every day, but I definitely feel good. I don't have low moods usually. And my energy is pretty consistent, but I just want you to see that as a carnivore or a ketovore, that I am healthy with my thyroid. I don't think I look sickly. And generally speaking, I don't really have symptoms. And you all know my story. And I just don't struggle with the same things. I know there's so many people sharing their blood work. And I kind of don't like doing this because it's one, it's kind of private information. But if it helps you at all, great. Over time, as my carnivore patients or clients aren't moving the needle enough with their thyroid markers, it's usually not the diet. I know that so many people want to think it's just the carbohydrates or not, but if it was that simple, people on a paleo diet would be healing because they don't eat the bad carbs in a sense. I think a lot of times it could be environment. It could be stressors. It could be lots of other things that we are not even considering. If truly we needed carbs, why does my blood work look okay? When I am five to six years carnivore, I am not an anomaly. So if this is the case for me, then it could be the case for other people as well. I don't ever under eat, especially because I suffer from an eating disorder. I never try to skimp on calories. I hope that this really helps you to figure out maybe I need to tweak things a little bit more or dig a little bit deeper, but it's usually not the diet or a need for carbs or no carbs or fruit or honey or reducing SHBG or something else. I mean, you could have low testosterone as a male because your DHEA is getting wonky. All right, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.